and so we'll look for that good. And if you would uh, leave a, behind a, a registry of your attendance here, one of the little uh, visitor cards that the ushers will make available to you, put it in the offering plate. Or if you're visiting with us online, there's also an opportunity for you to register your, uh, your attendance in our website. So we'd encourage you uh, to do that. At the conclusion of our service today, uh, during the final hymn, there'll be an opportunity for you to make a special gift to our deacons fund, the money that's set aside for special needs within our congregation and community. And also let me mention to you that uh, the uh, Table Talk magazines are available again. This is a publication of Ligonier Ministries uh, founded by R.C. Sproul many years ago, a blessing to thousands and tens of thousands of people over the years. They're free. You can pick them up on the literature table on the way out. They have a daily devotional as well as some excellent articles that you can use during the course of the month. So if you're looking for a good devotional guide, I can certainly recommend the Table Talk uh, magazine. Now hear God's call to worship. The Apostle Paul exhorts us Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing in His sight. This is your spiritual worship. Let's begin our worship in prayer. Father, we offer ourselves to you. We hear the call to come as living sacrifices. And so as drink offerings poured out upon the ground never to be recovered, as burnt offerings laid upon the coals to be entirely consumed, we offer ourselves to you. Do with us as you will. We trust you. You are a good God and wise in all your ways. Do with us as you will. But Lord, do not leave us. Do not forsake us. Brother, come to us in power. Reveal to us your glory through the operations of your Holy Spirit in this place, in this hour, and enable us to worship you, heart, mind, and soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Thank you. Please be seated. Our first reading in Scripture this morning is coming from Psalm 34, verses 1 through 10. Listen to this uh, reminder of God's faithfulness in providing for His people. Psalm 34, beginning in the first verse and through the 10th. And there is this heading that has been uh, edited in, 
describing this as a psalm of David and setting the occasion when this psalm believe, we believe was, uh, was written, when he pretended to be insane before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he left. Hear God's word. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but this, the word of our God, stands forever. Let's take a minute to pray now, especially prayers of confession. We'll pray about other things later as we go along. But this moment, we reflect on our own sinfulness and on the Lord's goodness and quickness to forgive, mindful that he does not take delight in the, in the death of any of the, the wicked, but calls all to repentance. And so knowing that he receives us when we come to him penitently, let us pray silently in the beginning, and then afterward I'll lead us in a corporate prayer of confession and an assurance of pardon. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, is this the way that we should have repaid you? You've nourished us. You've brought us up as your own children. The apple of your eye, your word tells us. That's how fond you are of us. You have furnished us all that we've ever needed. You've satisfied our desires. But the truth is that we have rebelled against you. We've ignored your patience with us. We have minimized your grace. We've taken your great faithfulness for granted. The truth is that we have not shown proper gratitude in response to the benefits that you have heaped upon us, all the bounty of your love and grace and mercy. And so we pray this morning in the name of Christ that for your own name's sake that you would pardon our ingratitude, that you would pardon our sin. Lord, our hope is fixed on you. Our hope is entirely upon you. What can man do to us except give us more trouble? But you, O oh Lord, can deliver. And so we pray that you would not remember our sins against us, our sins against you. We pray that you would put them behind your back as your word describes your readiness uh, to do. And pray that you'd grant us spirits of, of true contrition that we would have a steadfast dependence upon your Holy Spirit to point out our sin, to convict us of our sin, and to lead us to true repentance. Oh, Lord, we pray with your servant David, create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Renew right spirits within us that your name might be honored among your people and through your people among the peoples of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The assurance of the Word of God is that because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin, Christ came into the world. Because it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the righteous, came into the world. And by one sacrifice, made perfect forever those who are being saved through Him, those who are being made holy. 
And on this basis, believer in Christ, hear the declaration of God. You who are contrite, repentant, believer in Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His soul.
the ushers and deacons to come forward for our morning tithes and offerings.
We've prayed our prayers of praise, adoration. We've prayed our prayers of confession. Let us now pray our prayers of intercession, petition, as we again draw near to the Father. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you would keep our hearts from being far from you as we draw near to you with our mouths, as we honor you with our lips. And so as we've been bidden to do, we draw near to you with a humble boldness coming only through Jesus Christ, only through his blood, only on account of his righteousness, naming him as our Savior and as our point of access to all things divine. Great are you, O Lord, greatly to be praised. Lord, on this anniversary of the birth of our nation, we pray that you would not be a stranger in the United States, that you would not be like a traveler who just passes through, stays briefly, and then moves on. Instead, we ask that you would come and make your permanent residence among us. Our national sin testifies against us. We as a nation, as a people, are not worthy of your favor. We've sinned against you, against this land, against one another. And yet for the glory of your own name, we pray that you would not forsake us. Bring genuine repentance to us for our sins. Cause your face to shine upon us. Be the stability of our times. Lord, be the light for our path. We pray for peace. We pray for tranquility in our nation. We pray for the continuation of all of its liberty and that that liberty, by your grace, according to your wisdom, would be used for good, not for harm, for upbuilding, not for tearing down. We remember your word that says, to whom much is given, of him much will be required. And Lord, much has been given to us as a nation just 230 some odd years old, and look where you have brought us. Make us responsible for using all that resource, all that heavenly investment for good, for good, not for ill. Father, we pray you'd bless your church. We pray for revival in our land and that this revival would begin with your people as it always does. We pray that you would convict us of our sin, show us our desperate need, and draw us to Christ and set a spark ablaze in this land that nothing could extinguish. We pray for the future of South Lake Church. We're here, but we're fragile and we're frail and we're small. We need you to come and to bless and to enlarge and to enhance and to strengthen, to multiply. So put us in the position to receive those blessings and those benefits with hearts that are devoted to using all that you put into our hands for your kingdom's glory, not for our own selfish purposes, with our commitments to follow your lead, to seek you earnestly with all of our hearts that we might walk in your ways and use those things that you grant us so that we might become a powerful tool for good. We pray for those who are sick today, who are sick in mind and sick in body. So we remember before you with earnest prayers for blessing Dave Boozer, <coughs> Ginger Wilkie in her advanced age and widowhood, Rebecca Hop Hoskins as she and her husband and sons and family members wait the birth of their new son, Finn, Jim Stringfield in his weakness, Connie Pearson in her pain. Cat Cheryl in her special needs. For our sister Kay Mount with this broken bone that has plagued her overnight and will doubtless for some days to come. For others who are not named here but whose needs are very real, come and be their help, their consolation, their strength, their great physician. We pray for our family and friends. They're scattered in many places and many of them are scattered in their faith scattered in their world view, scattered in their understanding of what is real and what is unreal, what is true and what is false, what is worthy and what is unworthy. Many have wandered from the faith or resisting Christ even now. We pray that you would come by your grace and break down those barriers, remove those blind eyes and replace them with eyes that see clearly. Unstop those deaf ears, help them to hear the word and in the word find truth and in the truth find Christ and in Christ find salvation. 
We pray for those among us who are sorely tempted. All of us are tempted. Some of us sorely tempted. Some of us are at the verge of caving in and acceding <clears throat> to these things that lure us away from your paths. Give us resistance. Give us faith. Help us to believe that your ways are best even when these other ways look so good. We remember before you today those who work day by day in the health professions, doctors and nurses and therapists and counselors and technicians. Lord, strengthen them that they might strengthen others. Bring them to the peak of their skill, to a high point in good judgment and wisdom as they minister to the needs of others. Fill them with compassion even when they grow weary and reward them with signs of your blessing and your presence in their lives. All these things we pray with thanksgiving for your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Boys and girls, time for the children's message. Meet me up front here in front of the communion table, and we've got a little special moment just for you. You know why? Because we love you so much. We do. We're going to sit down right here on the floor. Yeah. Look at all these kiddos. Boy, we missed you last week. Some of you were scattered out at the beach. You were? You were too? Yeah, you were too. Well, I'm glad you're here this week. These several weeks, we've been talking about prayer. Do you ever pray? You know how to pray? You want to know how to pray better? You ever talk on the telephone? You have a telephone? You use mom and dad's or maybe talk on the phone? You ever call anybody? No. no. no? Some, anybody ever call you? Uh, no. Sometimes. You know how you talk on the telephone and when somebody calls me, sometimes I don't quite know what to say. So it'll ring and I'll say, hello. And they'll say, hi, how are you? And I'll say, oh, I'm fine. How are you? And then I don't quite know what to say. You ever get in that situation where you don't know what to say? Yeah, I You do? Yes, you do. We all do sometimes. Well, God knew that we might need some help in knowing what to say. And so when we talk to God in prayer, it's a little bit like talking on the telephone. We talk to him. We can listen and see if he'll talk to us. He talks to us through his word, not necessarily on the phone like this. But we talk to God in prayer, and he responds in real ways. Yeah. But sometimes we don't know what to say. But he was so good to give us some help. He gave us this prayer that he, we call the Lord's Prayer, and it tells us just how to pray. You know it? You know it? Some of you might know it. If you do it, if you do know it, let's say it together, and the rest of you kind of listen, and let's begin to learn it. It starts like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's how Jesus said we're supposed to talk to God. Wasn't he good to give us a pattern to show us how? Let's pray and thank him for that now. Lord Jesus, thank you for being a good and helping God, one who knows that we're weak and that we're small and sometimes we need to be taught, and you've taught us how to pray. Help us to use that lesson well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Good to see you. I got some more to say about prayer, too. Maybe you'll listen and hear some in the sermon. The Lord's Prayer is recorded in the Sermon on the Mount, and that's what we've been studying these several weeks. Um, Matthew chapter 6 is where we find ourselves today. Matthew chapter 6 and uh, verses 11 through 15 primarily, but I'll back up to the ninth verse to give us the fuller context. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, let me remind you what it is that you hold in your hands. This is the Word of God, which is living and active, 
sharper than any double-edged sword. It is this which penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It is this Word of God which judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now hear his word. Jesus says in verse 9, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the Word of God, which is flawless, like silver, refined in a furnace of clay, and purified seven times. Let's pray. Thank you for your Word, O Lord. Thank you for your Spirit, who opens our ears, our eyes, our spirits to receive your Word. We pray you'd spend, send him in fullness of power now to minister to us, that we might hear from you. In the name of your blessed Son, we pray. Amen. As Reformed folk, people of the Reformed Presbyterian tradition, we typically are known for our emphasis on the sovereignty of God, this idea, this truth, we believe, that God rules over all, that he is the Lord of all that he has made. He foreordains whatsoever comes to pass. He is the ruler. He's the great king. He governs all things. High and majestic is he, lifted up in all of his glory. But this might lead us to assume that because all that is true, because he is sovereign over all things and glorious beyond measure, that he might really not be so interested in us and our little lives and our little problems and our petty needs. But it should be of great comfort. I hope it will be of great comfort to you to recognize that in Scripture we are disabused of that false conception. That is not true because God is interested in us. God is interested in you. The details of your life, the needs of your life, the troubles and concerns of your life, and he wants to rejoice with you in the joys and happy occasions of your life. He's concerned with you. And the circumstances of your life, material as well as spiritual. And the Lord's prayer testifies to that fact. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. And following this invocation, our Father which art in heaven, he mentions six petitions. And the first of these petitions give glory to God. The first three of these petitions give glory to God. The first half, we're instructed to pray, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And so that does not surprise us. We think it only proper that in the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, the focus be on the Lord himself. The focus be on God. That's the sovereign God takes first place. No surprise there. But then comes the surprise. Look what happens. All of these next three petitions, the balance of the prayer, that deals with man and man's needs. Not just spiritual needs, those are important, but God's dealing here also with physical needs. And so it's an amazing thing to think that in teaching the model prayer, Jesus goes from these high and exalted things of the Lord, glorifying the Lord, seeking his will, his kingdom, immediately to the needs of man, to your needs, to our basic needs. Yours and mine. Give us this day our daily bread. That's just an extraordinary, a wonderful thing. These things are juxtaposed right upside each other. The glory of God and his right standing in our eyes, but also the very real needs that you and I have. Isn't that amazing? It is to me. And it tells me something. It tells me something about this sovereign God. 
This one whose name is above all names, whose kingdom is to encompass all things, whose will will in inevitably be done in all of the universe, that this same God is concerned about us. He's con this God is concerned about you. He knows your name. He knows your needs. He's a God who comes close, who looks into the particulars of your life, and who is always there to assist and to supply and to meet your needs. Concern is he even about the mundane things, the little things of your life. It should be a wonderful thing to recognize that secondary only to his own glory and the fulfillment of his own will and purpose that he would give attention to our needs. And not just some needs, but all our needs. So what I'd like to try to demonstrate to you in the next few minutes is the comprehensive nature to show you just how complete, just how all-encompassing is this second half of the model prayer of the Lord's Prayer when it comes to meeting the needs that you have, the needs that I have. And so in petitions four, five, and six, Jesus teaches us to pray for three needs of our own, to ask God for three things, provision, pardon, and protection. Let's look at them one at a time. Provision. Give us today our daily bread. Now, what does that mean? Some, some Bible scholars thought, well, that, you know, this comes right after all these petitions concerning God and His glory and the fulfillment of His will. Uh, we need to spiritualize this. This needs to be you know, a, a matter of concern for His, his uh, spiritual realm. The early church would say, um, God, Christ, would not descend so abruptly from all these high and exalted things about God to the mundane needs of man. And so they must be talking here about the bread of the Word, the silent Word, you know, that comes to us. Or maybe speaking of uh, the Word as it's revealed here in the Lord's Supper, this bread here. So maybe that's what this daily bread is is. The early church thought perhaps this was the way to un understand, to interpret. It took the down-to-earth but very biblical reformers, however, to say, no, he's talking about bread. This is the real meaning. John Calvin called this highly spiritualized interpretation absurd. <laughs> you guys are way off base, he said. Martin Luther had the wisdom to see that bread was a symbol, as he wrote, for everything necessary for the preservation of life. It's not just food. Luther says it's also things like a healthy body, good weather, a house, a wife or a husband, children, good government, peace, things necessary for the preservation of life. Some of you have heard of Edith Schaefer. She wrote a book about the Schaefer family called A Tapestry. She was the wife, you know, of Francis Schaefer, a theologian author, highly respected in the evangelical world all around uh, the globe. But he was not always in that elevated status. They were at one time just another seminary couple, poor, <laughs> like most seminary couples are, almost as bad as law school couples. Um, and she was in a prayer meeting with a faculty member's wife there at the seminary and prayed that the Lord would give them what they needed financially. They needed some money, and she prayed for money. And she was so embarrassed when the faculty member's wife rebuked her after the prayer and said, we only pray for spiritual things. That may sound very high and pious, but in reality it is so wrong. It is so wrong because we have it on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ himself that it is proper to ask God for material essentials of life. Give us this day our daily bread. But notice now, don't get carried away. Notice he calls us here to ask him for bread, the basic stuff, the, the basic stuff, bottom level, not for luxuries. Jesus didn't preach us, teach us to pray, give us today our stack of pancakes with real butter and maple syrup. He didn't teach us to pray, give us one of those 10-layer chocolate tort cakes like you see in the Christmas gift catalogs. He said, bread, the necessities. This is a prayer for that. 
And so God may be pleased to grant us luxuries and to grant us an abundance of the good things in this life, prosperity beyond the basics, but Jesus is teaching us here in our prayers to be moderate, to be reasonable, not to be greedy, to make our requests to him in a moderate way. Give us our daily bread. But it is daily bread. It is daily bread. We're to ask for the necessary things uh, every day. And so this implies that we are to go about this day by day, day by day, looking for the basic necessities of life that the Father would supply one day at a time. Give us this day. Now, you may be thinking, that's not exactly my idea of how to go. That sounds like a hand-to-mouth existence. Sounds like just getting by one day at a time. Who wants to live like that? That sounds like a tough way uh, to go, not knowing what the next day's rations are going to be or where they're coming from. Well, it may sound that way, but look at it like this. One thing for sure, if you live that way, you live in a fullness of faith and the provisions of the Lord. You learn pretty quickly whether God can be trusted or not. George Muller was a remarkable man of prayer. You've heard of George Muller. He operated orphanages for children. And in his career in operating these orphanages in London, he served over 10,000 orphans. 10,000 children and more came through his numerous uh, orphanages. And he supported them all through prayer. He believed this principle so strongly that he would not ask financial support from any man. We'll just pray. And he prayed and exhorted his supporters to do the same. Just pray and look to the Lord uh, to provide. And on one well-documented occasion in one of his orphan houses, there was nothing for the children's breakfast. Nothing in the house. But he had the children come into the dining room, nevertheless, sit down at the table as they always did, and bow their heads in prayer and pray, thank you, Lord, for the breakfast that we're about to receive. And just about that time, there was a knock at the door. And the baker was there, delivering enough bread for the whole house. And right behind him was the milkman. The milkman said, could you do me a favor? He said, my cart loaded with milk just broke down out here in the street in front of your orphanage. Could you take this milk off my hands? It's going to go sour before I can repair the cart. And everybody in the house had a good breakfast that day. We think that our way is better. We think that we're secure with our savings accounts. But the George Mullers of the world, they're the ones who are really secure. They're the ones who know where to place their trust. They're the ones who know beyond a doubt that the necessities of life come directly from God, and He's a good God. And they may come one day at a time, but they come in answer to prayer. And so what Jesus wants us to see here is in the daily provision of our needs, God is indispensable. God is indispensable. Of course, man is both body and soul. And so after the petition for the needs of our body, it's proper to move on to a petition for the needs of our soul, that they be satisfied as well. And the fundamental need of our soul, what does your soul need? Your soul needs pardon. You need to know that you're forgiven. You need to know that for your many sins, yet there is a pardon that is effectual for you. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness is as indispensable to the life and health of the soul as food is indispensable to the life and health of the body. And so here we are asking God to forgive our sins. Sin is like a debt. Sin is a debt. It's an outstanding debt owed to God. The wages of sin is death. This debt has to be paid. And Christians know that 
Their debt has been paid by the obedience of Christ in his life and by the sufficiency of his sacrifice in his death. The payment for sin is death. And Christ, dying in the place of his people, paid that debt. Paid it off. Not an installment only, but the full amount. Among the last words that Jesus uttered were these. It is finished. It is finished. And in that word, at root, there is a commercial term. It refers to the paying off of an obligation, the closing of a business transaction. It's over. It's done. It's handled once and for all. It is finished. And so literally Christ's words before he committed his spirit into the hands of the Father were, it is paid. It is paid. The debt is paid. The debt for your sins and mine. The debt for all of those who will receive the gift. Who will come acknowledging their need to get this burden of guilt, debt, sin off their backs. And realize it's been done in Christ. It's been removed in Him. So why then, if this is true, Pastor Dan, your little minds, I know, I can hear the clicking from all the way up here. If this is true, Pastor Dan, why should we be instructed to pray regularly that our debts be paid, that our sins be forgiven? Didn't he pay for those sins 2,000 years ago on the cross? Didn't he do that once and for all? You just said, it's finished. Yes, he paid. Yes, it is finished. But that forgiveness which was secured for us on the cross needs to be applied in the particular circumstances of our lives as we live those lives out day by day and moment by moment and sin by sin. Think of it this way. A wealthy man leaves his son a fabulous inheritance. I mean more money than you can count, more than the young man would ever be able to spend in a lifetime, though he tried. It could never be depleted. It's the son's. But the father is wise, and in his wisdom, he does not dump the whole load on the boy in an instant, not all at once. He sets it up in a way that the boy can have what he needs, but he must make application every time he has a need. When he wants some money, he's got to fill out an application form, so to speak. He's got to make a request, and then it comes to him according to his need according to the need of that day. He has all the money he'll ever need, but he gets it only as he needs it. That is the picture of the forgiveness of Christ. It is an accomplished fact. It is finished, but it is applied to us piecemeal, parceled out according to our particular needs and our particular sins day by day, year by year. You can add nothing to it. It's complete. It is intact, inexhaustible. But it has to be applied, has to be appropriated into our lives regularly as we confess our sins and as we receive that forgiveness. But there's another matter here, something else. The petition is that God would forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, if you have wondered what that means, wondered if God is maybe putting a condition on our forgiveness, then let me clear that up. Yes, he is putting a condition on our forgiveness. That is exactly what he is doing. What Jesus is teaching here is that our Father will forgive us if we forgive others. But he will not forgive us if we refuse to, give others, uh, to forgive others. Now, your mind is saying, well, there's something wrong with that. You're probably objecting to that. There's something basically amiss here. That makes it sound like we have to earn God's forgiveness. We have to do something to earn uh, his forgiveness. That is, forgive others. But we don't believe you have to earn God's favor you just told us about how reformed we are and 
how unworthy, you know, our anthropology teaches us that we are, nothing in my hand I bring, all that. We don't earn our salvation, don't earn our forgiveness. We believe that forgiveness, salvation, is a matter of grace. It's freely given. It's an in, entirely a gift. We do believe that. But that's not what I'm talking about. It is not a matter of earning God's forgiveness. That's not what Jesus means here. God's forgiveness of us is conditioned upon our forgiveness of others, but that's not the same thing as earning his forgiveness. Let me, ask, let me a- answer your question by asking you a question. Who is it that God forgives? Who does God forgive? What kind of person? What kind of man, woman? Does God forgive? The one who very flippantly casts off a prayer, oh, forgive me for that, but doesn't mean it. Flippantly, superficially, without earnestness, just say they're sorry, but aren't really. Does he forgive those who pray that way? No. No. God forgives those who are truly penitent. He knows the heart. He forgives those who have genuine sorrow, not worldly sorrow, but genuine sorrow for their sin, who are earnestly seeking forgiveness and who sincerely appreciate the blessing that they have been given. That's who God forgives. And if God forgives those people, forgives those who are truly penitent, how do you recognize someone who's truly penitent? God knows, but how would we know? One who is truly penitent is one who is truly broken. Who is truly broken by the recognition of his sin, her sin. Who's not trying to make excuses, tiptoe around it, minimize it, but who owns it and is broken by the thought. And who in the face of forgiveness is thankful, deeply thankful full of gratitude for this unmerited favor. So you recognize him by his own humble, forgiving spirit. One who has experienced that forgiveness at that depth, with that level of appreciation, will have a forgiving spirit. Having been forgiven so much, he'll be ready to forgive the relatively trivial sins committed against him. If you want to picture of this fleshed out, consider the parable of the merciful servant in Matthew 18. I'll not take time to review that for you, but it gives a wonderful illustration of the point that I'm making, the unmerciful servant of Matthew 18. So if you refuse to forgive, you're putting your soul in danger. This is a serious matter. It's testifying to the reality of your own forgiveness, of your own contrition, of your own repentance. If you refuse uh, to forgive, you're in danger. It indicates that you have never experienced fully to the, to the bottom of things God's forgiveness. Because if you had, you would appreciate it. You would recognize something of the enormity of your sin um, and of the enormity, therefore, of your forgiveness and furthermore, of the enormity of the price that was necessary to be paid for your forgiveness to be granted. Without God's forgiveness, you're doomed. We're doomed without God's forgiveness. Only God can forgive sin. Only God. And so when it comes to pardon, God is indispensable. But we're in need not only of God's forgiveness of sins, but also God's protecting care in the future. And so we come to our final petition, protection. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Some have tried to make two separate requests out of that. But it's best understood as one request that's just expressed in parallel terms. One request is negative, lead us not into temptation. One is positive, deliver us from evil. Don't do this, but please do this. Deliver us from evil or from the evil one. And the difference between evil and evil one is a a detail of grammar that leaves the matter a little ambiguous. Probably best to be understood in a personal way. Evil referred to here as the adversary himself, as the devil. And so we have evil one. 
We know for certain that Scripture teaches that God does not tempt us. He doesn't tempt us with evil. That's the devil's business. That's what the devil's forte is. So it doesn't make any sense to pray that God not tempt us since he doesn't do that anyway. Why would you pray against something that doesn't happen, has no potential of, of, of occurring? And you can't think of temptation here as trials or difficulties because we know that Scripture teaches that God does test us. He does bring trials, difficulties into our lives. We had a very helpful discussion of that in Sunday school today. By the way, you ought to be in Sunday school if you're not. He uses those trials for our good. He has a good purpose, a constructive purpose in the hardships of our lives. And that's why we say that these two phrases, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, are just two parallel parts of one petition. And they're two parts that mean essentially the same thing. It's the evil one who tempts us to sin. So the devil, the tempter, the liar, the father of all lies, the accuser of the brethren, he's the one who is in view here. And the prayer is that we'd be protected from him. And we need his, God's protection. The prayer is that we would not be overcome by these temptations which continually assault us. We're thinking here of those temptations coming from without, the devil. But let me tell you what, old Dan can generate some temptations within as well. So I'm on guard outward, but I'm also on guard inward because I have some idea of the capacity of my own life to drag me uh, into sin, my own heart. We need Christ's protection. The devil is too strong for us. The devil is too strong for us, but he's not too strong for God. Without God's protection, we are sitting ducks. We are vulnerable in the extreme. We're virtually defenseless, but God will deliver us. God will protect us. God will show us the way if we call upon him. And so in this matter of protection, God is indispensable. Do you see it? Alone, we're lost. For protection, we rely on God. Indispensable in our protection, just as he is in our pardon, just as he is in our provision. And so it's an amazing thing to contemplate just how beautifully comprehensive these three petitions are. In principle, they cover everything that we need. They're representative of the entirety of the need of mankind. God is indispensable in the material realm. And so we pray for provision, for daily bread, for all the necessities of physical life that only God can provide. Ultimately, you understand how that works. I can go out here to Food Lion, but that's not really the basis of my provision. The provision is in what God has provided. Understand? God is indispensable in the spiritual realm. And so we pray for pardon, forgive us our debts, for the forgiveness for the cleansing of sin that only God can afford. Lady Macbeth may cry out, out, damn spot all night long, but she'll never purge herself of her sin. God is indispensable in the moral realm. We pray for protection. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Asking that he who has already conquered Satan has already nullified Satan's dominion, would deliver us against Satan's wiles. You may have wondered where the doxology is, these final words that we pray in the Lord's Prayer. It's not recorded here in this New International Version anyway that I've been using. There's some serious doubt, as scholarship has advanced, that that portion of the prayer was authentic it doesn't appear in the best, most reliable ancient manuscripts. The idea is that those words, that doxology of praise on the end, was added somewhere along the way afterward by scribes, those who were copyists, those who were copying. But if that is true, then you can almost understand why they felt the necessity. They saw the completeness. They saw the excellence of the prayer. So we can contemplate how our sovereign God the one who sits enthroned on high, stoops to us as a loving father, meets us so completely in all of our needs. 
that you would automatically expect a burst of praise to, 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 to arise, that response uh, to be given. A doxology is in order whether it is authentic uh, or not because it would be the natural response to the faithfulness, the sufficiency, and the love of this indispensable God. How extensive is that love? How meaningful is that love? Look at the table. Consider the sacrifice of the only Son of God, represented here in the broken bread and in the outpoured wine. We invite to the Lord's table all of those who are trusting in Christ for their salvation and who are members in good standing of any evangelical church. Doesn't have to be a Presbyterian church but a church where the Bible is regarded as the Word of God and Jesus is upheld as the only Savior of sinners. We also invite those who are truly penitent, who are repentant of sin and who are willing to disavow any known sin in their lives. So the one word of warning is that if there is a sin you prefer over Jesus, you need to stay away from His table. He died to forgive that sin, and if you prefer it to Him, you have no place here. Repent. Cast that sin away and then come and partake of the tokens of the sacrifice that makes that forgiveness possible. We do not include our youngest children until they have been instructed and examined by the session and granted admission to the table because there is the prohibition in Scripture that we not handle these things in an unknowing, unknowledgeable way, not discerning the body but that we understand, at least in basic form, what it is that we're doing here. That is the invitation. That is the one word of fencing of the table. Here's how it all began from Luke's gospel. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I'll not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I'll not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And in the Passover ritual, there were multiple cups that were used in symbolic fashion. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace, your accommodation of slow-minded sinners like us, who need something to touch, something to taste, something to see, some words to hear, to put us more in possession of the truths of the gospel. And so we bless you for this table. We bless you for the provision here of a reminder of what Christ is, what Christ has done. But beyond this, we bless you for the promise of his presence, the one who says, this is my body. This cup is the new covenant in my body blood. Thank you, Jesus, for pledging to meet us here, really, and personally, until you greet us in the flesh in that final day. And so we come in obedience to your command. We come seeking a fullness of love and gratitude for what this all represents, what it means or should mean in our lives. And we come praying for the outpouring of your Spirit here that all who eat and drink here by faith may be made true partakers of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. As you come, we'll ask you to approach by the center aisle, receive the bread, receive the cup, return to your seats by the sides, and then we'll partake of both elements together once everyone has been served. If for any reason you cannot make your way to the table, let us know, and at the conclusion we'll come to you and serve you the elements where you sit. Our youngest children, as we've noted, are not included in the supper, but 
if their parents would like, I'll be glad as their pastor to give them a word of blessing as they come by the table. So what we do, we do in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he gave it to his disciples to eat. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink from it. And they passed it around, and they drank. And I, ministering in his name, offer it also to you. Please come. to be served, received the bread and the cup. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the body of Christ given for you. There's no greater love than that a man would lay down his life for his friends. 
Jesus calls all his friends those who will obey him. This is the cup of the new covenant in his blood. Let's pray. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds. It's like to that above. We thank you, Father, for the vertical dimensions of this sacrament, whereby sinners express their affection for their God on high, their Savior who's ascended at your right hand. We also would acknowledge the horizontal aspects that we who are one in Christ participate at one table, which is His. And in so doing, pledge not only our love heavenward, but also outward in the church and in the world. May these not be empty tokens. May this not be a false symbolism, but may it be the true expression of our minds and hearts and our spirits. Thank you for letting us be your people. Help us more and more effectually to be your people, doing what your people do, thinking what your people think, believing what your people believe, and acting as your people act. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, past unmeasured, boundless free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness.
Now, people of God, receive the blessings of God. Go in the strength of the one who alone can keep you from falling and who can present you before his glorious presence with fullness of joy, hope, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen.